So guys, in this section, we will talk about the urinary bladder. Uh, we already talked about the blood vessels supplying the urinary bladder, the superior and the inferior vesicular artery in the branches of the internal iliac. Uh, from the PGMA exam point of view, what is important in the bladder is to know that how the interior of bladder looks like, what are the features we have in inside, and also the extension of certain muscles of the ureter into bladder and bladder muscle into the urethra. So for that, we need to open up the bladder and see the interior of it. So let's look into the interior of the bladder first and then followed by we'll talk about the nerve supply as well. Okay, so here we go. Let us say this is the uh, interior of the bladder. I'm looking at this. Let's presume that is a prostate gland. <clears throat> Here are the opening of the ureter. And that force is the trigone. So some important four or five questions you will see that uh, which is which can be asked from the interior of the bladder. Now starting with, as we said, this is the opening of the ureter, ureter which is opening on the posterior wall of the, of the bladder. So what you see between the two ureteric opening, there is an elevation here, which can be an important landmark in the cystoscopy and that is called as the interureteric ridge. This elevation is called as the inter ureteric ridge either you call it interureteric ridge or it is also called as the bar of mercier this is interureteric ridge or also referred as the bar of mercier similarly there is a ridge which is extending now this is one ridge let me just give it a different color here this is one ridge between the two ureteric opening and we also have a ridge extending from the ureter to the urethra that is called as ureterourethral ridge not as prominent as the interureteric but it's there this is the uretero urethral ridge ureterourethral ridge and this ureterourethral ridge it is also called as the bell's bar That is called as a bar of Mercier and this is called as a Bell's bar. The question here is that what are these ridges made up of? Why do we have these elevations? You know, ureter is coming into the bladder and then obviously it is uh, ending at this angle of the trigone. But the inner longitudinal muscle of the ureter, those longitudinal muscles that we have inside the ureter, they are not ending at the ureteric opening only. They go beyond the ureteric opening into the bladder and then run towards each other and also toward the urethra and forms this ridge. So both these ridges, let me just highlight them with the same color, this interureteric ridge that is bar of Mercier and also this uretro-urethral ridge or Bell's bar, they are both made up of the, the longitudinal muscle of the ureter. Longitudinal muscle of the ureter. Imagine we are talking about the bladder. It's the longitudinal muscle of the ureter which continues inside and gives rise to both these elevations. That is one question here. The interureteric ridge and also the ureterourethral ridge. Second important question which can be asked uh, uh, from the interior of the bladder only is about the trigone. Now, if, when you look at the rest of the bladder, I mean the rest of the bladder, the, we have these mucosal folds. There are rugae which are present. There are rugae, we have these mucosal fold present in the rest of the bladder, but that is not seen in case of the trigone. The reason is, why the trigone is smooth? Why the trigone is smooth? The, the reason for the trigone being smooth is because the mucosa of the trigone is directly adherent to the underlying musculature. There is no submucosa in this case. I mean, submucosa is the one which is present. The connective tissue in the submucosa will give rise to these folds. But there is no submucosa in case of the trigone. So trigone is smooth. 
trigone is smooth as you compare it with the rest of the bladder the reason is because there is no sub mucosa that also could be a good question to be asked the reason for the trigone to be smooth is because there is no sub mucosa in case of the trigone another important uh, question from the interior of the bladder could be in male bladder you will see that elevation close to the apex of this trigone here and this elevation guys is called as the uvula vesicae that is the uvula vesicae now this uvula vesicae is because of what that again could be a question this uvula vesicae this tongue like projection that we have uh, this uvula like projection that we have in the uh, in the apex of the trigone it is because of the median lobe of the prostate it's the median lobe of the prostate which produces this elevation called as the uvula vesicae now we said ureteric muscles that is longitudinal muscle of ureter is continuing inside the trigonal part and forming these ridges the trigonal muscles are the one which will go beyond the trigone and they will also produce an elevation into the posterior wall of the prostatic urethra and that elevation is called as urethral crest there is an elevation that you see in the posterior wall of the prostatic urethra called as a urethral crest and the answer to the question why do we have this urethral crest that's an aims question it is because of what it is because of the trigonal muscles the trigonal muscles are the one which extends and that gives rise to this urethral crest ureteric muscles are having the elevation in the bladder and the bladder muscle that is trigonal muscle are going downward and forming the elevation in the posterior wall of the prostatic urethra called as urethral crest so these are some important things about the interior of the bladder you should know about these elevations what muscles there because of trigone is smooth because of no submucosa in that part extension uh, the median lobe of the prostate producing this uvula vesicae and this elevation called as urethral crest that is because of the the muscles of the trigone <clears throat> knowing the interior of the bladder guys another important thing that in the bladder you should know is about the sphincters and the deuterocere muscle what nerves are supplying them what sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve and somatic nerves are supplying the bladder that is also important so let us talk about the nerve supply of the urinary bladder so let's talk about the nerve supply of the bladder so once again if uh, i put it schematically here this is the bladder and let us say this is the internal urethral sphincter and let me put this external urethral sphincter here internal urethral sphincter i'm writing in short and this here is the external urethral sphincter the voluntary one that is the external urethral sphincter and obviously the muscle in between that will be the the deuterocere muscle here that is a deuterocere muscle in that region so it's all about knowing the nerve supply to these muscles that is deuterocere to the internal and the external urethral sphincter okay starting with the sympathetic nerve first now let us say if this is the uh, the sympathetic part of the spinal cord the sympathetic nerve which are supplying the urinary bladder it comes from the T11 T12 L1 and L2 we are talking about the sympathetic nerve guys we are talking about the sympathetic nerves you know thoracic lumbar outflow t1 to l2 out of which t11 to l2 nerves these are the ones which will come and they will contribute in the formation of this plexus called as the hypogastric plexus well hypogastric plexus 
which will then form the vesicular plexus hypogastric plexus is having sympathetic and parasympathetic component both we are looking at the sympathetic component now so it is contributed for the urinary bladder it is contributed by the t11 to l2 and then the nerves from this from this hypogastric plexus this sympathetic nerve will go and supply the deuterocer muscle which are inhibitory to the deuterocer but they are excitatory to the internal urethral sphincter that is about the sympathetic nerves whereas the parasympathetic nerve if i go with the parasympathetic part and also the somatic nerve simultaneously coming from s2 s3 and s4 s2 s3 and s4 the pelvic splanchnic nerves right s2 s3 and s4 they will also contribute to this hypogastric plexus let me write in short that is hypogastric plexus and then again from this hypogastric plexus the nerve which are going supplying the deuterocer muscle and internal urethral sphincter exactly opposite to what sympathetic were doing they are excitatory to the deuterocer muscle and they are inhibitory to the internal urethral sphincter these nerves here are the nervi erigentis coming from s2 s3 and s4 these pelvic splanchnic nerves they form the nervi erigentis which are excitatory to the deuterocer muscle and they are inhibitory to internal urethral sphincter s2 s3 s4 is not only the parasympathetic component of the spinal cord this also gives rise to the somatic nerves also like usual somatic nerves which comes out so one of the important somatic nerve coming from s2 s3 s4 is the pudendal nerve and that pudendal nerve is supplying the voluntary sphincter that is external urethral sphincter so coming from this s2 s3 and s4 again this nerve which is going and supplying this external urethral sphincter that is the pudendal nerve that is a pudendal nerve which is supplying this external urethral sphincter this is the bare minimum you should know about the nerve supply of the urinary bladder the sympathetic nerves which are coming from t11 to l2 contributing to hypogastric plexus and the nerves then are spreading to the deuterocer and internal urethral sphincter inhibitory to the deuterocer excitatory to internal urethral sphincter nervi erigentis performed by the pelvic splanchnic nerve s2 s3 s4 excitatory to the deuterocer inhibitory to internal urethral sphincter and then somatic nerve that is pudendal nerve coming from this is the parasympathetic component isn't it that this is the parasympathetic component the nervi erigentis and pudendal nerve is the somatic nerve the somatic nerve it supplies the external urethral sphincter is coming from s2 s3 s4 only the pain sensation from the uh, the urinary bladder and the feeling of this distension of bladder is carried by these parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve only and please understand this guys the pain sensation is carried by the same lateral spinothalamic tract you know lateral spinothalamic tract is for carrying the pain sensation even the visceral plane the bladder plane is also carried by the lateral spinothalamic tract now just look at this if this is the spinal cord i'm not going into too much of detail of that and we said lateral spinothalamic tract if this is a lateral spinothalamic tract this is the one which is carrying the pain sensation from the bladder awareness of the distension of the bladder that sensation is carried by the dorsal column tract it's through the dorsal column tract that awareness of the distension of the bladder is carried that is why um, in case of this intractable pain anterior lateral chordotomy if bilateral anterior lateral chordotomy is done look at this if the anterior lateral bilateral chordotomy is done it can be done to relieve the pain but still what will be left there the awareness of the bladder distension and the desire to micturate will still be intact in that case so in case of the bilateral chordotomy anterior lateral chordotomy if it is done 
so obviously the pain the the fibers which are carrying the pain they are the one which are uh, which are demolished in this case in the anterior lateral chordotomy but what will be preserved the dorsal column tract is preserved and that is why as i said the awareness of the distension of bladder will be still intact so this is about the <clears throat> the urinary bladder the interior of the bladder the important nerve supply that what nerve supplies with sphincter and about that where the pain sensation and the the distension awareness in the spinal cord will run through